Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming along to this session. This session is called Still the Most Important Companies in Music. And we're very, very privileged to have the panel that we have here this afternoon. Um, it's made up of some um, very amazing label people. Um, I'll perhaps just give each of our panellists a very quick introduction so that you guys know who they are and a bit of their backstory. And then we can jump into having a conversation about um, each of our panellists' experiences um, in running record labels. Um, so on my left, I've got Nikki Robertson. Nikki was a talent scout for Parlophone uh, while living in LA. She was also a, making music videos for major label artists um, before deciding that she wanted to start a label with Paul Tao called I Am Sound uh, in 2006. Um, I Am Sound um, has made some very important early releases for artists like Banks, Florence and the Machine, Ms. Mr. Charlie XCX. Also, um, I Am Sound also does a lot of other things, puts on events and, and is a brand agency that collaborates um, for lots of large brands in, that are doing things in California. Um, next is Michael Goldston, aka Goldie. Um, Goldie was an A&R man at Epic for many years through the 90s, signed seminal acts like Pearl Jam and Rage Against the Machine. Um, and after stints running uh, DreamWorks and then Sire started his own record company, Mum and Pop, um, which is a New York-based indie. Um, Mum and Pop is home to Sleigh Bells, Neon Indian, Kindness, and Australian acts like Courtney Barnett, Flume, uh, the DMAs, and Jaguar Ma. So a very strong Australian contingent on that label. Um, next across is Jacqueline Saturn. Jacqueline and Goldie actually worked together at Epic. Jacqueline um, ended up as the VP of promotion, so she worked radio for Epic and was instrumental in working with Goldie and the two of them helping break Pearl Jam, Rage Against the Machine and a raft of other acts. Um, a couple of years ago, Jacqueline moved across from that role to be the co-GM of um, a label based in LA called Harvest, which is Capital's kind of tastemaker um, and incubator, has acts like TV on the radio, um, banks um, and our own preachers are on that label. Um, Dean Bain started True Panther Sounds in his bedroom in San Francisco uh, in 2004, is that right? Um, to put out his own band's seven inch uh, to a record, moved to New York, um, 2009 signed Girls and now is part of the Matador family. Um, got a pretty incredible list of acts that um, is on his label. Uh, DeLorean, King Cruel, Real Estate, Shlomo and Tobias Gesso Jr. Um, and lastly, Johan Panaya, um, who's the boss of IOU. Johan started throwing warehouse parties in Melbourne many years ago. I think I went to a few of those. Uh, and IOU has kind of evolved into one of our most respected indie record labels here in Australia. Um, acts like DZ Death Rays, Violent Soho, the DMAs and Green Buzzard, as well as touring lots of bands and doing lots of other cool things. So if you guys could just give a quick round of welcome to our panellists. Um, I thought I'd start, Dean, with you, if that's all right. Um, you, the first release you ever put out was your own band's Seven Inch, um, Red Tape Apocalypse. Yeah. Uh, so Richard Russell from XL, um, Chris Blackwell from Ireland, Tony Wilson from Factory, they all said if the first record they put out hadn't been a hit, they wouldn't still be here today, wouldn't still have a label. So was it a hit? Um, yes, in, in, in the smallest way possible. It was like, uh, I'm trying to make a joke and I can't. It was a, ter <laughs> it was a terrible were you, were you wearing diamond grills after uh, you put out that record? Yeah, before, during, and after. Then we moved up to platinum. After <laughs> but it was like, I mean, we put it out because we had started a band just as a hobby and wanted to like book the DIY tour and we're like we should have some results so we each put in a hundred dollars and figured out how to release a record and silk screened it and so it was it was a hit in the sense that we made 500 and then all of a <coughs> sudden had like uh, 300 dollars more than we started with and we're like well we could each have 25 bucks back extra or invested in someone else's music. And so, so you obviously you reinvested it back in putting out releases. 
is that was that the process for the early years of the label? Was that how you survived? Um, yeah, I mean, it was really like uh, I don't know if I should feel embarrassed to say this or not, but like there was for the first few years, there was no ambition to do anything other than like to put out one record and hopefully like sell enough in order to be able to afford to put out another one and kind of like document the the scene or community of people that I was a part of in San Francisco and just make some pretty things that lasted that you know a small number of people would enjoy and stuff so uh yeah and then uh, it, like something like Team Core came along and then that all of a sudden changed the entire scope of what the ambition was for things but what it was one thing at a time literally like sell enough and <laughs> have enough in a PayPal account to make like a down payment on to press another seven inch or something so that's cool and um did you find that as you went along along the path your skill set and your networks expanded that made the label able to scale up and do bigger releases is that how, you, how it worked until yeah, up until the point that you Join forces with Matador? Yeah, well, I think that, I mean, like, uh, I'd been playing music since I was really young and kind of part of a punk scene, and I realized I never thought it would be a job ever um, until actually, like, I sat and signed a contract with Matador and was like, wow, okay, well, this is a job. Yes, but, um, so I'd put out, like, a compilation tape and, you know, like, been a part of releases and things and booked DIY tours like from the time I was 13, 14 years old. And so all of a sudden I realized, and especially after moving to New York and like trying to learn how everything worked, not having had any experience or seeing anything, I was like, well, actually there is, there are certain skills and like, you know, r community resources, whatever that you picked up just on, as a part of like being a DIY, like a part of a DIY like punk scene that has like tentacles all over the world and stuff. So it's interesting because obviously breaking records can be a very expensive and, and a large investment process. But Nikki, I think I read somewhere that you'd said you were sick of making music videos for bands that you felt like wouldn't be around in twelve months time or for artists and that encouraged you to, to go and sign for bands of your own and, and start a label. Kind of I guess on the same line of questioning as Dean was addressing, how did you even know what to do? I mean, back then I was directing for a company called Partisan and I kept getting, like, I kept writing on like Nickelback videos and really like videos that I didn't like the music for. And so I went back then on MySpace and found bands that I liked and realized that none of them had, you know, managers or a label or anything. And I was like, but wait, there's all these amazing bands that I could work with and do their videos, but also release their music. and. I also then was able to get a iTunes account. Back then, when I started I'm Sound, you could have your own iTunes account and just release stuff through that, and we, I did that. And one of the first people I found was Florence the Machine, which obviously then led to distribution for myself and funding through that and all of that kind of stuff. So it kind of was not, I didn't, I never thought, one never really wanted to start my own record name, but it wasn't something that I kind of like woke up. It just, it literally just sort of happened and snowballed. So was your pitch to artists in terms of the value that you're bringing, do you think it was largely about, I guess, what we call A&R, like generating great videos and... and yeah, and content and, and content. just, you know, I always was, I always kind of came up with the ideas of, you know, you should use this director, this is how we should push this and kind of came on as like a sort of creative with with the artists, which, um, you know, having never worked at a record label per se, that, you know, I think that some artists really related to that and were interested. So it kind of helped lock in a lot of the early artists just on that. Mm. Um, and then in terms of, of the marketing, of actually finding the audiences, was it just that the content was so good that people were taking it up and it was creating its own groundswell, or how did you? Um, it was a combination of, I mean, Paul and I, I remember, vividly when we when we kind of we flew to New York to go and try and meet magazines and we we also flew to Chicago to try and meet Pitchfork none of these people had replied to any of our emails and I remember I sat in Fader's office and I'd said that I you know I was I tried to meet with uh, Matt Schnipper at the time and he he actually came out of the office and I kind of introduced myself and I think he you know having experienced that sometimes weirdness now that I, I think he was a bit taken aback but Paul and I just went out of our way, really like pushing our music and just kind of like 
saying, listen, we've got this great band and we did the same with Pitchfork. And, you know, I think over time, just all these people kind of realized that maybe, you know, what we were doing was interesting and the bands we were finding were interesting. So a lot of the marketing was just getting up and just like waking up, putting on clothes and knocking on doors. Um, Jacqueline, that kind of, you obviously spent a lot of your career in promotion and I get the impression from what Nikki's saying that it's obviously a lot easier to find an audience for content that's really great and, you know, if the assets and the artist is exciting, then it's much easier to get people across the line. Was that, what was your experience in radio? Was it, how hard was it to break an act that, you know, that you didn't love necessarily or that, was it? <laughs> well, I mean, well, luckily I got to break a lot of acts that I did love. So yeah. I think in the beginning and, you know, there was a part of my career that was, you know, when I actually, when, when I worked with Goldie, where it was like every day was amazing. I mean, amazing. The music was incredible. The artists were breaking every rule and s changing the game, mm. saying a lot of no's, mm -hmm. doing things their own way, you know, d making sure the art was, was exactly how they wanted. And that whole thing was an incredible experience that, I'll, that, is, that changed, like, it, it has helped me at Harvest Records more than, more than people know um, as as the years went on and, and we had a lot of changes at the company you know there was definitely a period where it just like I missed the unbelievable a and yeah. people that I worked with the, the, the talent that they were going after you know you kind of wake up sometimes and it's like okay this is starting to like not feel good and I had only been in my career on passion I mean all of it like how I got in the music business you know, finding your first job, being a receptionist, whatever you're going to do to get there. And then once you kind of wake up and the ceiling is, you know, falling, you're just like, okay, I've got to, I got to make a quick plan so that I can be happy because it's, this is what I want to be in. So, but I think that, um, and, you know, as far as radio promotion, like if you love that part of what it is, it's, it's okay that you can, you know, you can still see the value in promoting something, whether you love it or not. Do you think, and having moved from that role to being the GM of a label, what sorts of things have you learnt that you weren't expecting from going from a specific area of the business to obviously, you know, being in charge of it all? Um, well, I've learned that it's the hardest job ever, um, that it's, like, challenging but exciting and, you know, rewarding but extremely hard. It just, there's never, I, in, the, in my first year, there was so much to learn, and it was great every minute of it, but just a lot. You figure out, like, whoa, I haven't been in these parts in a long time. And then you sort of realize that the day turns into night, into the day, into, you know, you're, you're responsible for so much, so you don't really get to ever turn off, which is, you know, luckily being in promotion, that's how it is, but it, it, it's, it's constant. And then you, you know, realize that so many of the people that I respect, I mean, you know, Goldie was the first person who basically, when I said, I have this opportunity to go to Harvest, was like, you need to do this. But you, you know, you look at people like it's not, it's like a friendly competition because you want everyone to be successful. But you start to realize like, God, everyone is like really busting their asses every day. You know, it doesn't, the success doesn't come from like a, you know, a wand or anything. Everyone is like killing themselves to do these amazing things for the artists. So it's a lot, big learning curve. And Goldie, obviously, you had a similar but opposite, I guess, trajectory starting at AR and then moving across to, to managing labels and then obviously ultimately owning, running your own label. Um, I read somewhere that you described Mum and Pop as having the DNA of a management company. And obviously, you started it originally with, with Q Prime, and that was. How do you see that, the difference, like when you say it, it had to. You know, having been at um, a number of major labels in terms of the philosophies, in terms of whether it was deal making structure, philosophy, the approach to marketing, um, I had only really sort of existed on that side of the fence. And so when we started Mom and Pop with Peter and Cliff at Q Prime, <coughs> um, I remember the first deal was a singer songwriter and was an artist at Columbia had decided that had only sold 90,000 records and it wasn't really enough, so they dropped the act and I said, I, I think I'll, that, that'd be enough for me. So I remember, I remember giving him the, con you know, walk, going down the hall and giving him the contract thinking, there are things in here that I'm just gonna get yelled and screamed at because they're too artist friendly. And he sort of 
he sort of looked at it and took a Sharpie and marked a bunch of stuff out and was like, gave it back to me and said, um, it wasn't in favor of the artist enough, so now go finish it. And in, in general, the, the working with them was, um, it was like the conscience. They were able to sort of um, give me a different perspective in terms of being on the other side as managers and trying to, to set up deals that were as equitable as possible and as, you know, um, in the spirit of sort of um, ventures and partnerships and, and structuring deals in a way that um, was, was equitable. And it was, it was great to sort of have that background and perspective from them when we got started. But what do you think enabled you to make the deals so much more artist friendly? Was it that the deals were more proportionate to the what you were trying to achieve? Like, if <coughs> Columbia dropped an act that sold ninety thousand. Well, records. yeah, I mean, it's it's. I mean, those those numbers you know are are, are different now. Obviously, seven eight sure. years ago. But but in 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 general, I think it was um, approaching it um, as a partnership in the truest sense of the word. So you. You've got your outside publicist, you've got your manager, who in, in that case was a woman named Debbie Wilson, and she did sync. So she did sync, we had a PR person, we had myself, we had the people at Red, and it was complete transparency, and you sort of, you learn to take a perceived weakness and turn it into a perceived strength by people working together and eliminating those sort of, you know, traditional boundaries of, you know, label and artist and label and manager. and. and start to break it all down and, and, and you're able to sort of approach things in a more holistic way. Mm. Um, Yo, I wanted to ask you about, I mean, you've obviously had lots of great acts and uh, well known for signing very early, really good Australian acts, but I really like the trajectory of Violent Soho since they joined your label. Violent Soho, for those who don't know, you know, have been around for quite a while, have had a few life cycles, a few different rounds of managers and I think they've had US and Australian deals before and it's never really worked notwithstanding that Lots of people think they're very talented and great, and yet, what do you think, like, why did you sign them, and then what do you think, why did it work yeah. this time around, what was the thing? I mean, <clears throat> I signed them because I love the music, and I love the records, the tracks that they were demoing at the time, and I loved everything that they'd released up, up until then, I was always a massive fan. Um, the reason why the record that we put out went well. I think it's just because the music was really good, the band is good, or some people consider them to be good. And that's really it. I don't think like I can, I'm not, I can't sit here and go, I owe you made that band massive, because it's not really true. I like to think that we assisted them to um, do the things that they wanted to achieve and, and then some, but I think it ultimately comes back to them. You know, the, the credit goes to the four guys in the band. They're the ones that made it work. We're all lucky, like I'm lucky enough and um, my good friend Nick Yates who manages them, we're lucky enough, <coughs> sorry. We're lucky enough to work with them and, you know, and and play a role, but it, it's, I give them all the credit for it, for sure. Yeah, cool. Do you think it was their time with the right team around them? Or do you uh, think yeah, maybe, I mean. Was there a different approach? As in when you guys, when you and Nick, talk through it, was there a strategy that you put in play? I mean, our label revolves around a certain demographic of kids and so perhaps we were a good vessel to actually introduce them to that to those kids in a more direct format than perhaps previous labels were able to. Um, in terms of strategy, like, you know, we definitely sat down and had a lot of conversations at great length about the aesthetic and the way that we wanted to roll things out. The first thing that we actually released for the band was a seven inch, which was a double A side. So coming from a major label um, release, you know, that poured hundreds of thousands of dollars into making a, what was a great record with, you know, one of the biggest producers in the world to then coming back to Brisbane and, you know, dr driving down to Melbourne and making a seven inch that then that was the first thing that we started with here. That, you know, that was all sort of part of the strategy rather than just going and making another record. And even the record that we ended up making, which went on to do a lot better than the previous one in Australia, um, you know, it was recorded in a shed in Brisbane at a studio. It's called The Shed Studios. That's, um, you know, when you look at the previous record, which was made in a barn in Wales over six weeks with Gil Norton. You know, that's a very vast... Um, a vast, diff a vast change. I mean, ultimately, it comes back to the music and the people making it and, you know, their drive and passion for what they wanted to achieve. And, yeah, perhaps it was just their time. They, they 
they captured um, you know, the Australian public's imagination and hopefully people will continue to stick with them. Mm. Um, and Dean, when you, when you brought True Panther Sounds across to Matador, was that a hard decision to let, to let go at some level of control? And what, like, what could you see that Matador could bring to your label that, that um, you couldn't do without them? It was, it, it was like an easy decision, but a really difficult transition, I guess. Like, the, when they, they actually, like, they approached me really, I was very surprised. Um, and for me, it was, I had asked all these people that, you know, I'd known for a long time to sort of entrust me with their music, and like, just me, and I had no, no, nothing financial to offer them. All I had was, like, my time, which was after my day jobs and like I commit 100% of 9 p.m. to like 3 a.m. to you and your, <laughs> and your work um, and then to you know kind of soon after that be able to turn around and be like actually now we are moving into this system which is you know in my opinion like the best like no shots fired or anything it's like the best independent label group and you know and to have a like a whole like worldwide team of people who can support them going from one kid who doesn't really know what he's doing to have that it felt amazing you know um the transition from and i think this is something like we've all even in the last few minutes touched on like from being really the only p person like who is on the either administration or like whatever the back end of the artist so everything like whether it's management or like booking one-off shows or like do, working on artwork, all that stuff, like it goes through you and moving, letting go and like trusting a whole team to work on, um, you know, what they're best at. And then by extension of that, actually like learning how to work even with like managers and uh, booking agents and accepting that in some cases, you'll actually just be like delivered, you know, like delivered a record and your job is really to find the, the best home for the record, not to think as like holistically as when you started. I'm getting way off track. Uh, uh, that's, that's good. I guess a question I was talking to someone from a while ago from 4AD who was saying when we sign bands, we tell them if you want commercial airplay in, in America, we can't deliver that. Or like, yeah. if you want that and if you offer a deal from us or Atlantic or us and Capital or whatever, you know, you're gonna have to go to the major label because we can't do that. How, how do you find, I guess, particularly for the three of you guys doing, uh, sorry, the four of you guys doing it out of the US, how do you find that scale? You know, you've obviously, Goldie, you've come from very large labels to having your own standalone label. Dean, you've gone from having a bedroom label to being part of the beggars group. Jacqueline, obviously, you're part of the major, a major label system, and Nikki, like you guys, are still running a pretty lean operation in LA. How do you find that affects the way you have to go about breaking records? Because it must be very different for all four of you, right? You want me to go? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, part of what I, you know, I don't want to speak for all of us, but part of what I think we all strive for is to to find a symbiotic relationship with an artist wanting to work with us and us with an artist. And so if you define those, the approach and those expectations and you're transparent about what what you think you can bring to it and what you may not be able to bring to it, you're usually able to sort of figure out really quickly whether or not um, it's something that could be a fruitful situation. And I think that um, you have to, I mean, you ha no matter where you work, you have to be judicious um, about what you sign. I, I had a conversation with people on the other side or majors who sometimes, you know, situations where they'll sign bands that are really indie-minded and that's the, the wrong paradigm for them as well. So. You really have to be, <clears throat> um, you sort of have to be f beyond objective about what you think your, your strengths are as a label so that you can go through that experience together and, and, and know that um, at the end of it, everyone will feel like um, they, they executed what, what they talked about. Mm. Is that hard, Jacqueline? Is that hard for you? Because obviously, Harvest is part of capital and you know, you've got probably maybe higher expectations, I don't know if that's a fair comment, in terms of your sales for your artists on that label, and you bring with it the ability to potentially access, you know, major label radio promotions teams more readily, but a lot of your roster are 
artists that could just as easily be on a mum and pup or on a true panther or on, is that a hard, how do you go getting that balance in terms of? Well, I think that, um, you know, when we first, like the label, you know, I've been there, it's just two years. And in the very beginning, people were trying to understand, like, was it harvest and is it an upstream and what about capital? And and I, look, we, we were like, okay, we need to like really be able to explain this. And we really care the most about harvest, about our team, about our artists and doing, you know, getting the most exposure, the best plan or, you know, partnering with the artists and really carrying out their vision and making sure that they really feel like, you know, we are all in tune with what they want. And so to that part, it's been amazing because we really feel like, you know, of course, there's, you make mistakes or you figure out, like, you know, how to do things better. Um, that's been great. Being a part of a situation where you can access certain departments at, at a time, whether it's the, you know, sync team or the promotion department, in my new role has been an interesting situation. Yeah. Because you, you know, you of course there's expectations, but you know, your artist, you're so, you, you <coughs> keep so much control about it, you just want everything done the way you feel it should be. And when you see something not exactly how you want, you know, it gets, it can be challenging. Um, is that fair? Yeah, right. that's, I, I feel like, um, Every like every record or every artist, it can be, you c it can be successful if it's like scaled properly, you know. So like your first question of, was the first record like, yeah, it was a success because it was scaled, you know, yeah, yeah. about where it should be. And I think like as independent like independent labels or like the boutique kind of like specialized arm of a major, it's like we have to be able to um, accommodate different artists, different campaigns, like scale s scale them and kind of design them to fit whatever. And I think I can look across here and there's an example for uh, many examples actually that's like of artists that have found really significant audiences, indie artists that have found like significant audiences without the traditional like indie support or tastemaker people like Lord Huron we were talking about on I Am Sam, um, like, uh, you know, artists you, that maybe didn't get, like, that theoretically should get huge radio play, but didn't, and yet found their own audiences this way, or like, whatever. There's a bunch of different campaigns that they, they fit the person. And if we're not able to do that, then I don't, I guess it like shouldn't really exist or something. Because, <laughs> but luckily I think pretty successfully do. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, obviously, you know, record labels are still probably the largest, I guess, venture capitalists for a lot of artists in terms of making records and videos and, you know, a lot of tour support and getting artists, you know, from a place of maybe potentially having no audience to a place of having a meaningful audience. Um, how are you finding, I mean, obviously, again, what Dean said is right. It's clearly it's about scale and depends on the artist and no one, there's no not going to be a, a unified answer across the board. But... How much does it cost to break an artist? I mean, obviously, it's going to be very different in Australia to the US, and obviously, it depends on the artist. But uh, I mean, how much of an investment are record labels making in this kind of climate when record sales are, are dwindling? I think that's a tough one because, I mean, for example, Dean bringing up Lord Heron, who um, we signed. I mean, they were kind of a really small local band, and their first album sold over 100,000 copies, wow. which you know, brought into play radio, which I think something that I am sound have never heard ever in the whole of its office. <laughs> and so, you know, getting to, getting onto AAA and then, you know, explaining to the band all about radio and just how, you know, it's a whole nother world. And for us, it was, it was a kind of a big deal. And so for the second record, um, which we're up to nearly 50,000 on that, we are moving forward on radio, but that's something that I had never, you know, talking about scalable things. I mean, I'd never pitched for any of the artists that we work with that we could give them a full uh, radio campaign. Does that mean yeah. you're reinvesting a lot of money back into the radio campaign? We're investing a lot of money, yeah, yeah. In, in radio. And I think in, I think it's paying off, but I think, you know, I think that for us, or for me personally, I had to, you know, they, they had to get that success for me to understand it. I don't think we weren't in a position as a label to be able to offer that off the bat. Yeah. 
Um, about to sleep at night, I imagine. Yeah, not sleeping at night, and I would have been living in a tent. So. <laughs> <laughs> Goldie? As far as, um, I mean, obviously, it, it clearly depends, but I, I mean, as far as, I mean, look, the, it's, it's a little, it's a little bit of what, what Dean was alluding to, you know, scalability, you know, breaking mm -hmm. is subjective to a certain extent. I mean, Lord Huron is a band that has broken that can sustain a career for 10, 12, 15 years for as long as they want to keep making music. So um, I think breaking in the more traditional sense, um, you know, has, has sort of changed. And mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, for, for us, we, we end up working with a lot of artists that, um, that end up having, um, that are in a position to have an incredible level of um, longevity, but the sales aren't necessarily commensurate with their level of success. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, a, a lot of it was what Mark Geiger was talking about, is people are looking at, at the wrong numbers instead of the entirety of what's going on with the career. And if we're contributing to that and that artist is playing to 3,500 people in Atlanta and touring the world and doing what they need to be doing and doing what they want to be doing, um, you know, then you've, in essence, helped contribute to breaking an artist. Um, and the numbers are, are, are somewhat secondary. Hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, for me, someone like FKA Twigs is a prime example. She has a she has a career and a platform now um, where she can do anything, really. I mean, she could really move... Her next project could be writing a soundtrack for a movie or starting her own fashion line. Or, I mean, her, she has leveled her own playing field, if that makes sense. And I don't know whether, you know, her record sales initially when she came out were probably underwhelming compared to how much hype she'd had but that she's an artist that I would say has been broken not through sales but through just being a creative entity within the business the, of the music business you know so I think that you know I think that you kind of have to sort of understand the artist that you're signing and working with before you start signing on board because you know, with a lot of artists we work with, they probably sell about, you know, 5,000 records, but, you know, they, they're successful in other ways, maybe sync or touring or whatever. So I think, you know, I think success is sort of a personal thing, yeah, isn't yeah. it, really? Yeah. Yeah. So, Larry, we're talking to you. Or, all right, no, sorry. No, no. I, wonder, I think FK took this, like, really great example, actually, because it, I think for break, like, breaking, it ha it is expensive. Like, mm. that whole thing is expensive. It's just that I think her team and both like the amazing like Young Turks and the management, every like they've spent money not in the traditional places, you know. So where you know in the United States, commercial a commercial radio campaign is like for an independent label a very significant like expensive undertaking. Um, so they're like, well, but her, let's spend a ton of money on the videos. So it's a, you know it's not cheap, but it's way beyond like what an indie budget would be but you know that's where they're spending it and they're taking that maybe from like ads and billboards and a radio campaign and so and so and she went and I think for the first year like I don't even know how much money she makes on the road or she does now but I think for the first bit she took every dollar and put it back into the stage so like that that was an investment. It was like, I think that project was very expensive and everyone took every dollar that came in and put it back into it until it kind of broke, you know, but not in the traditional places at all. Yeah, because it's still, I mean, she's a great artist, it's an amazing record. It still hasn't actually sold many records, yeah. am I right? Yeah. yeah. Even though she's obviously a phenomenon and, it, you know, it's having yeah. a large cultural effect. Um, her, Jack like, her e the EP, I think that, you know, is this concept like short outsold it did it's out outsold first week of like the album in yeah, the wow. states which is pretty interesting shows that yeah. it's scaling up and yeah. growing you know up, yeah, up, yeah. Down, yeah. Down. yeah 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 um and Jacqueline you we were talking a little bit backstage about you guys working together on Pearl Jam and that era and you were saying for Pearl Jam and Rage back then to be so I guess creatively strong-willed and to say no to so many things not shoot music videos and not do <laughs> traditional things was a rarity, and it certainly seems like, I mean, do you feel like artists now are much stronger in what they want and clearer vision? I think that, um, you know, my experience, like, 
from working with bands like that where, you know, that became the mantra of like, you know, making sure that they, with these artists, you know, Pearl Jam and Rage, like they weren't going to do things. You know, there was plenty, uh, many no's, I think. <laughs> many a no's. But now, I mean, I, I feel very lucky, the artists that I've gotten to, to, that I get to work with at Harvest, like they have such a great vision of how they see things and what they're willing to do. And, you know, you don't have to make compromises. And you really, you know, like I said, I've been in the major label system for a long time and to be able to, you know, where they have full creative control, where they, you know, under, where you can sort of say, well, you know, you can make that decision. You know, this might not happen if we do it that way, but that's okay. And, you know, like Goldie mentioned before, it just, you, you just have to be able to say everything very clearly. But, you know, the, the ones that I'm, these artists that I'm working with, they, they know exactly how they want to, how they want to do it. And that feels very good to be able to be partners with them. Death Grips. Yeah. Like, that's a prime it's example. A prime example. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the like, best example you can Yeah, give. it's like a, an artist that are just like, fuck <laughs> you. Yeah. You know, yeah. sorry. It, it, yeah. Yes, um, I know it's so funny because we dealt with rage, so it's like not a weird thing to have to deal with death grips, except for that, you know, one thing I will say about them, completely diligent, everything was turned in on time, the artwork was done by them, like the experience that we had with them was so incredible because they knew exactly how they wanted everything to be. And, um, you know, they, they were comfortable with the decisions that they made and we were proud to have them on the label. And that also derail your plans, though, sometimes? 100%. 100%. <laughs> but th those are the artists that make, I mean, those are, the, that's, those are the artists that I started a label to work with, you know, those artists that actually have a vision for what they actually want to achieve, not artists that, not to say that there's anything wrong with that, but artists that, you know, want to be told what to do, that's not something that personally really excites me. I, I look at IOU as hopefully a vessel for artists that we love just to, basically there to support them in whatever they want to do, however they want to do it, and nearly just be there as an advisor, which to go, like we have art, artists on the label that do things or don't do things that personally I think they either should be doing or shouldn't be doing, but ultimately all I, all we can do is give, tell them what the repercussions of doing something or not doing something is and, and then back them on it. And that's, that's what we're all here for, I guess. Yeah, cool. And obviously we kind of touched on it and touring and live and all the other aspects of an artist's career is, going to be, is pretty important for you all in trying to break records and trying to build you know, a sustainable career both for your artists and for the investments that you've made. Is that a hard thing not having any, a lot of that is out of your control? You know, you don't often get to make the decisions, you often don't participate in the income, but you know, more and more it seems that without a strong live base it's very hard to sell records. How does that affect the decisions you guys make? Um, the live component in terms of the signing process? Yeah, like, you, I mean, Goy, you've, sold, you've signed a bunch of acts that are from Australia that, you know, you know when you signed and Flume, I think it only been over maybe once. And yeah, I think he it was could easily once. have turned around and said, I'm not that interested in touring in North America. I'm huge in Australia and I can... Well, I think that that's where, where there's, there's, you know, you could make the case that there's been a shift from a technological standpoint because people are discovering him, you know, as you know, through his record and remixes and associations and people are able to, to get exposure and, and, and can go navigate a SoundCloud um, despite the fact that it's not very lucrative for us, but in, but in general it helps build audience and it's a little bit, you know, it depends on genre, it depends on artists. I mean, obviously, I think what separates him is the fact that he has come over, you know, probably eight, nine times by now. Um, and that's why, you know, um, that has really sort of built an audience for him beyond um, what I think people would even sort of expect or know based on looking at, um, you know, just the, the pure numbers of, of, of records sold and, you know, but between the streams, SoundCloud, record sales, and touring, um, you know, um, I think that's why he's, he's in a different position as he goes forward in his career because it isn't just you know, it isn't just the stream, it isn't just the SoundCloud, it's, you know, the fact that he's come over and spent so much time has is, is made a significant impact for people to, to have a connection with him artistically. Yeah, but it must be hard, 
when you see, like, I'm thinking of Coachella last year when he headlined Sahara stage or Gobi mm-hmm. stage, whatever, and it was the biggest, that stage is attendance of the festival, and it was 15,000 people had all come to see him and were, you know, way, way, way out of the tent. Right. Is it hard trying to get your head around how do you convert that into selling records and into getting those... Well, I think that, you know, look, I mean... I, I mean, it must I, be exciting, I wanna, but it's, it, yeah, but I don't, I don't want to go off path too far, but I think, you know, we, we did an article, um, as I'm sure you know, but, you know, about the New York Times in terms yeah, yeah. of how do you measure success. Yep. And, um, you know, what, what people may perceive as, you know, okay to sort of moderate, you know, great numbers for, you know, for artists to be, in, you know, 60, 70,000. But you can't look at those numbers anymore because it's it's only um, a slice of a pie. And when you start to to combine that with with streams, um, you, it starts to paint a different picture in terms of how many people you've impacted. Um, for a company our size, um, that's becoming really meaningful income, you know, and it's continuing to grow as as, as Mark was talking about earlier. So. Um, you know, between what he's doing from a live standpoint, um, what those masters are worth on a publishing side, um, what the streams are starting to mean, and then record sales and sync, you know, you start to get the picture of, um, you know, a significant, um, significant level of, of impact and success. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I think the, num- the, the numbers are still looked at backwards, I guess, is my point. Yeah, yeah. So, I guess, I mean, the, do you see the, the labels that you guys all run changing a lot? I mean, have they changed a lot in the last couple of years? And do you think moving forward? I think they're, all, I think they're always changing because, yeah. you know. Well, Nikki, yeah, yeah you, I mean, I, you do a lot of non well, two years stuff. ago, we started an agency and we brought in this girl called Anne Doe who was, ran a department in Urban Outfitters and, and the idea behind it was basically, you know, we'd been approached by a lot of brands for our artists that we work with and they had come on and said, you know, well, we'll X, you know, X, Y, and Z play the show and we were like, well, hey, hold on, what about I Am Sound coming on and doing either events or whatever. So basically the, the agency now is, um, we deal with a lot of music um, events. We do digital videos and we also work with visual artists um, that basically across the board kind of, we monetize working with, with these brands and we have a roster now of working with like Ford and Dell. Um, we work with Dazed, uh, Nowness, Vans, Topshop, and all these brands basically cultivating um, money streams for them or notoriety for the brands within the music realm. And we don't necessarily work with artists on I Am Sam, but we work with other artists. I mean, for example, we did something with Dell at Sundance this year where we had Run the Jewels play, and it was like a whole week of different events under the Dell bracket, um, and Pitchfork came on to help media promote. But... You know, I think we, we came we came up with this idea of doing that as another stream of income for the label, but also just to have those contacts. You know, I can now reach out to Dell and say, hey, I've got a brand new artist uh, that I would love you to check out. Give me X amount of money for him to go on the road. You know, so it's kind of a two-way street, but we got to that point where we were like, instead of just sort of pushing away the sort of like brand and all that kind of like sort of... Uh, weird culture that you didn't want to get involved with, we've completely embraced it and we've done it in a way that I think is actually pretty cool and I'm really proud of it. Um, I think, Jacqueline, you were talking about when you worked at, um, at Epic, you'd often see records break through very small markets, maybe a very small shard of light come through. It might be Mobile Alabama that, you know, radio starts playing a track or it could be you know, a sync, or it could be, you know, lots of different ways that, that music can find an audience. How do you capitalise? How do you guys, when you have those moments, how can you use them in the best way? Like, what's... I think, you know, one of the things, like, 
I think that all of us probably up here, like you're so passionate about your artists. So, mm. you know, and you already, like you believe the most, right? So then when the, you know, through all the hard work and when the stars start aligning and the first spark comes, it's, it's so exciting. So there's nothing that can stop you at that point. Whether it's, you know, like I, I think I, well, I was in a panel before and I spoke about, um, we have glass animals on our label and they've had such an amazing, you know, uh, this, their, their streaming story has, you know, been one of their, their biggest stories that we've had. But when we originally thought that one song was gonna be the sort of single, not really radio, but just the one that was positioning, but then the stream, you know, the song Gooey would not stop and would not go away. And it was every week so exciting. And then, you know, we got to really um, build a plan around it because of what was talking to us. It has been so much fun and so rewarding and it, and it so keeps going. So I think that, you know, that, sort of belief and then the spark, you know, you just build the plan around that. And I think that, um, you know, that's the most fun. I think that's probably everyone would say that when you see that one ray of light and you're just like, just okay. Just grab onto it. Yes. And don't let go. Don't. <laughs> just keep water. Don't move. Like. It must be a beautiful feeling to see something working and to see all those bits and pieces of your businesses and teams, you know, firing and something really succeeding. It's nice when it works, but yeah. I mean, even even when it doesn't, it's still like I don't know. Like we're we're releasing a record for a band in November, um, which has been it's been a you know it's a bit of a, a bit of a slog. But I mean, it doesn't make it any less rewarding, and it's like the, it doesn't make the music not as amazing in my in my mind. But I, yeah, I remember like when we first started the when I first started the label, like we'd get like a little like street press column, and I'd like look up who the <laughs> Who the um, like who the writer was, and I'd make sure that I found their email address and like email them and say thanks and like send them more and like that's I guess when you find that little spark, you just like hold on to it and don't let it fucking go <laughs> and try and like keep it all keep it all moving. Um, yeah, I think I've Goldie. There's something you said that I really liked in an old interview talking about how people who are in the business can sometimes be callous about acts because. You know, if you run a label, you over your career will sign a whole lot of acts. If you're a manager, you might manage a whole bunch. But if you're the artist, you only have the one career. Um, y y yeah, is that a is dealing with talent? I mean, I imagine dealing with talent could be one of the hardest parts of the job. Is it having that responsibility? Um, and I think that um, you know, you have to have a certain level of sensitivity about it because of what you're alluding to in terms of. Um, Making sure that that that, that artist, it, it, you know, may only have that that you know, truly sort of one pure great opportunity, and making sure that you know you can you know you can never ensure their success or promise their success, but what you can promise and execute and, and hopefully fulfill is, you know, that that the journey and the experience and the way that the music is presented and how it's framed and how it's. Um, you know, given its chance to find audience, I think is what a, every artist would want to know so that they don't have to sit there and wonder, well, if our song had reached mm -hmm. people, if our, if our record had been promoted and marketed properly, you know, would I, you know, would I be in a different place? And I think, you know, um, you know, sometimes you do have to have very difficult conversations with, with artists. Um, but I think if, if, if the experience itself has been what they always imagine, regardless of maybe necessarily the outcome, then I think that um, that's what we all strive for. I think is, is to make sure that that experience mirrors what we what we portray, or to our, to the best of our ability. I think that's really important. Mm. Well, I think we're slowly running out of time. I thought, given the subject of this topic was um, the most important companies in the business, I thought I'd just kind of get. <laughs> We'd circle back on it and um, I guess get a sense of what you feel like artists can't or artists get from record labels they can't get elsewhere. I mean, I'm sure there's lots of aspects to it and we don't have to cover them all off. But I don't know, Nikki, when you're signing, like you sign a lot of LA bands, mm -hmm. do you think, do you feel like you've built or you're helping to build a community? Yeah, I mean, we sign a lot of LA bands, but also I sign quite a lot of English bands yeah. and I think a lot of the, uh, a lot of the early stuff that I signed. You know, it was the idea that these guys are doing well 
in the UK. I really want people in the US to, to be able to experience this music as well and get to know these artists. So I think that was a lot of the thought behind the, some of the signings that I had. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know what any what you guys think as a crew. Well, like, I mean, a lot of, I guess, you know, a lot of artists are making their own music sure. and delivering yeah. art a lot of the yeah. time. I mean, there's still lots of great A and R work going on in terms of making records. There's also a lot of artists that are essentially A and R in their own sure. recorded music stuff, and you know, there's plenty of artists who will say, oh, "I've made it. Can I just stick it up on SoundCloud?" And their managers or their teams around say, "Don't do that. Not yet." Yeah. I like to think that even that you know, through probably all our own, like past experiences and things like that, we've learned different techniques or marketing methods and things like that that we can still advise artists on ways that they can get the people that they want to hear their music, even though they might be creating and delivering it mm. even to the, to the artwork, there's still some sort of, I guess, knowledge of the back end things that, that perhaps we have a slightly better understanding of just because we've done things before. Um, yeah. But we'll go back to that. what Jacqueline was saying as well, just like, you're, you know, if you find a band and you're like so passionate about them and you just want to like work with them, I don't think, I think that's your, your biggest, you know, the biggest tool that you can offer, that you're going to be working for them, you're trying to get everything broken for them in, in all means possible, whether it's through live, helping them get gigs or what have you, or just, you know, just helping them. And I think that that's, passion is one of the numero uno things that I, that I look, that I look for working, you know, with the artists that I work with. Yeah, I Definitely. imagine there's a lot of work that goes into it, so you don't have that passion, then it's yeah. hard to justify yeah. it. Forget it. I think, I mean, there are, there's artists, a lot I can think of that, like, don't need record labels. They have their own culture, they have their own business, they, like, they don't need it. Like, I think there's a ton, you know, besides just the initial investment, some people need financial investment to, like, make music. If you're an international artist to have a partner in another territory that's, like, offering structure, not, not structure, but also, like, insights onto mm -hmm. stuff you're saying, you know, like, Glass Animals, all of a sudden, like, not a crazy amount of sales to begin with, and then, like, what, 12 million streams of one song or something, and just kind of like, what is that about? How can someone from one country understand what that means in another, you know? And then, certainly, like, an international label set up, then maybe you have partners that can coordinate your whole, like, your whole campaign, your whole career, and um, what have you, and... There's, there's the sort of practical, I suppose, back-end stuff. There's the element that I think there is still, record labels do have value in making something like feel real and making, you know, an album is uh, whatever you want, marks the like evolution in an artist's career oftentimes, like w whether they sell a lot or they don't. It's a lot of what like the economy of, uh, of music is like based around the artist. The campaign like begins with the album and then it goes however long it goes and that's still a reality whether or not it will be that way in a few years. I don't know. I think it probably will for at least a few more years. Mm -hmm. But um, there's those real things and then of course there's like the passion and the, um, you know, like advice and it's like the kind of classic A&R stuff of it's... Um, it helps, like it helps, it takes a village sometimes to make like a work of art that's really like transcendent and lasts for a long time. And, like, um, I, rem I remember like there was one artist who's like, first album was cool, this next album I'm gonna produce, mix, write, record mm. everything entirely by myself because I wanna be like free. And the conversation room was like, you think you're actually freeing yourself but you're putting this like, crazy burden on yourself and you're gonna drive yourself in crazy because like to have a, a label or produce or whatever those people help you and that like it I think it leads to a better a better final product or whatever. Yeah I remember reading an, I listened to an interview with an artist and she'd said her last two records which had both been mega hits had been excruciating processes to make she'd spent months in the studio the producer was anal retentive and pushing her and then she said this new record was the funnest record I've ever made <laughs> and it, was, it flopped yeah. <laughs> she made it in 12 days and had a great time but didn't have that kind of that 
yeah, that creative pushing pull. Well, I think we'll probably run out of time, so I just want everyone to put their hands together and thank our awesome <laughs> panelists for their time and insight. Um, and I hope you enjoy your rest of your big sound. Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs>